I am back from vacation from an undisclosed location. I know people in other parts of the world say holiday. We say vacation in America. I don't know why, but I can find that out. Anyhow, so one discussion I had, a real world discussion, because last week I had a limited virtual world. I was not online very much. I did a lot of conversing. And one conversation was, are we really getting smarter? Now, looking at the, the, the newspapers and the media, you can see there's this big dumbing down of America, right? A dumbing down. But the IQ tests and scores of Americans are going up. On the Wall Street Journal, there's this article called, Are We Really Getting Smarter? Essentially what's happening is that um, the ability to think abstractly, to, to use symbols and things like that, that's a, a, a different thing than like morals and ethics and your ability to survive and be happy. Because 100 years ago, the people lived off the land. If you, weren't, if, if, if you weren't strong, if you weren't tough, you just simply starved to death, right? There was hard times 100 years ago. The people were very strong and, and, and so forth, but they didn't deal in an abstract world. It was a physical world, right? So when they take these abstract IQ tests, they did a lot worse than people now. So this article says that in 1910, the average IQ compared to today was like 70, right? From our perspective, 70 is pretty low IQ. From their perspective, our, our IQ was between 130 and 150. Compared to them, we're geniuses. Or compared to us, they're imbeciles. So what's going on here? So I'm reading this article, and um, it's, it, it's, it's very good. It, it shows how you know, our, our, our world is becoming more abstract, requiring more abstract thinking. So that, that is really advancing, and that's what a lot of these IQ tests measure. For example, there's a, this test called the Raven's Progressive Matrices. And they were, they, they were given this test out you know, last century, and they're giving it out now, and they can see the scores going up. This is one of those tests where they give you shapes and say, what's the next shape of the sequence? You know? And if you're using the computer and you've got icons, you're clicking around, right? That's, you're doing that subconsciously because you, you have to find out what you're going to click on next. And each, the icons kind of give you, cue, give you clues of what, the, what, what you're clicking on and so forth. And then when you take these tests, it's the same kind of thinking. And back then, there was, they, they, they had no experience like this in their worlds. So when they see these things, it's like a foreign thing to them. It's like an abstract thing. So they also did some interviews. So here's this. Russian psychologists in the 1920s interviewing some peasants. Now, I don't say peasants in a negative manner because I come from peasant stocks, right? My, my ancestors were peasants. They're starving people. They came to America for opportunity. So I kind of feel like I, I, have, I have a point to make, right? You know, like my ancestors struggled to get by, and here I am. And I want to master this abstract world. I want to show my ancestors that they didn't live in vain, that, they, that their descendants carried on and prospered and succeeded, became highly educated intelligence, right? Of course, I don't consider education a, a piece of paper diploma. I consider education your ability to think and reason. Okay, so here's the, here's the psychologist ask, asking a peasant a question. The question is, what do a fish and a crow have in common? The reply a fish, it lives in water, a crow flies. Wow. Did that person have any listening comprehension skills? The, the, the guy was asking what the things, these things had in common, right? A fish and a crow, what do they have in common? Well, they got blood. That would be something they have in common. They're both alive, right? That, they have that in common. They live in the earth, earth. That has in common. The reply, a fish it lives in water, a crow flies. That's not a thing they have in common. That's the thing they have in difference. The, 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 what's the person doing, right? And so the, the, the psychologist asked a question. Could you use one word for both of them? The answer was, if you called them animals, that wouldn't be right. A fish isn't an animal, and a crow isn't either. A person can eat a fish, but not a crow. What? Uh, it's like this person would appear to an imbecile to us. We're thinking, who is this imbecile? They must be completely dysfunctional in the world. But these, this person was a highly functional person living off the land, surviving in hard times. This person was probably thinking, who is this silly man in a suit asking me dumb questions? 
He's going to ask me dumb questions. I'm going to give him dumb answers. That was probably what's going through this person's mind. It's like, what do a fish and crow have in common, right? All I care about is I eat the fish and I can't eat the crow, right? I mean, that's all I care about. One word for both, I mean, what does this matter? That's what they're thinking, right? And that's, I think, one reason why the IQ tests are so much lower is that people, they didn't think in those regards. They didn't think about those things. They thought in terms of, well, what can I eat? How can I get by? What will help me? Here's another example. The psychologist asks, says, there are no camels in Germany. The city of B is in Germany. Are there camels there or not? And like our reply is, well, if you're telling us there's no camels in Germany, you're giving us a hypothetical example, right? If we assume there's no camels in Germany, then of course there's no camels in the cities in Germany either, right? You know, we, we understand that that's not a real world application. Whether there are camels or not in Germany doesn't matter. For the sake of this question, you're asking a question and based on your assumptions, this is the answer. But of course the peasant says, I don't know. I have never seen a German village. If B is a large city, there should be camels there. And the guy's saying, no, listen, for the sake of, the sake of this example, this, I'm just telling you there's no camels there. And the person's like, well, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're questioning the whole, the, the whole assumption. So it's kind of like, you know, um, this person is being practical. It says, hey, I live in Germany. What are you talking about elephants for? That's kind of the response, right? I live in the real world. What are you talking about? This is highly relevant to markets in silver. Because the markets operate on abstract levels. We have futures contracts. We have, we have all kinds of things going on, right? There, there, there are no physical pits where people are trading silver back and forth physically. They use an abstract layer to determine price discovery. And it feels counterintuitive. To someone in the physical world, it almost seems like nonsense. What's going on in these markets? So over the last four or five years, I've seen a lot of channels and opinions and so forth, but I've also had a memory of who has had the most accurate price projections and predictions, not promises. The people never promised it will hit this. They would say, these are the scenarios, right? I would see who, who are the abstract thinkers that have had the best record and who are the ones who've been wrong over and over and over again. And I think what we're getting at is almost this um, physical world versus abstract world way of thinking. Going back to these IQ tests, you had the person living off the land saying, what are you silly asking me about what do a crow and a fish have in common, right? And what I'm seeing in some of these channels, the most popular civil channels, we get over 10,000 views. It's, their, their mentality is, this, this is you know, kind of like, what do a fish and crow have in common? Who cares, right? And then we have the people who are consistently extracting wealth out of the markets, right? There are a lot of people who I follow who don't have huge viewership, but over a period of four years, I'm watching them and they're making money in these markets. And it's like, geez, like it's interesting. But one thing too is that making money in the markets means that you have your money in many markets, right? You have dozens and dozens of trades. So if one trade goes sour, you know, that's, it happens on a regular basis. You have dozens of trades and one trade goes sour. Actually, the word trade is wrong. You have many investments. So if one investment goes sour or whatever, right? Um, that's, how, that's how they're thinking and I'm seeing their success. But on the other hand, right? I'm reading this book. It's very good. He's talking about how in 1987, how so many of these traders went bust. You know, they, they, they had a thing that worked for decades and then suddenly in 1987, boom. Big disaster. So what I'm seeing right now is I'm seeing a certain way that's happening, right? So I, I'm going to read this book more. What, what I'm saying is that we have, a, we have a physical world versus abstract world thing going on in, on, on YouTube. And it's, it's very fascinating. So thanks for watching.